Welcome to Broadview United. We're glad to have you worshiping with us here for Sunday, October 25th. This is the last of our four-week series on 1 Samuel. So we're glad you've joined us for the series and for its conclusion. We acknowledge that we're on the land of the Coast Salish, particularly the Lekwungen, and we give thanks for their stewardship upon this land in which we work, play, and worship. Today we journey through to the end of this story, and uh, I'm grateful to have had the time away uh, to renew and reflect and to think about the things that are coming before us and for Margaret's leadership. And so I invite Margaret now to light our candle. As we gather here in this beautiful space, we're reminded of the light that calls us. We're reminded of the light that holds us. And of course, this light is not sacred unto itself, but it comes alive as it is invoked in your personhood. And so wherever you are this day, as you light your candle, either real time or symbolically, we uphold this light that joins us together. We've been eight months into this pandemic and we still miss each other deeply. But as we focus on the light of Christ and how this light is manifest in the world, there is still so much to give thanks for. Behold the light, amen. Share the joy of sin. 
we gather for a time of prayer, we remember that this is not a magic potion where we uh, send something off into the upper regions of the sky. It's a time though to connect with each other and with God and with our world. And so I'd invite you now into a time of grounding and a time of listening as we come together in prayer. In sunshine and shadow, in the beauty of the fall colors, in silence and song, in quiet conversation with a trusted friend, we listen, we learn, and lean into your presence, O oh God, and give thanks for your beauty and love. When our hearts break in grief, when we despair over the collective indignity of systems that are firmly entrenched, when we toss and turn like Samuel in the middle of the night, we listen, we learn, and lean into the spirit of healing and hope. And we give thanks for your presence and your peace through all of the seasons of life, through the complexities of discerning our way through times of change and challenge, through an amalgamation and a pandemic, we listen, we learn, and we lean into our leaders, giving thanks for the wider body of beautiful souls who work on our behalf. The Holy One, so much has changed in eight months, and none of us have a crystal ball. Even still, we yearn for justice and joy to surround and lead us forward. And so it is, we listen, we learn, and lean into the legacy and the person of Jesus, who offers us insight, courage, and bread for our journey. Dear people of God, as you listen and attend to all that tears your hearts in two, so too may you be met with God's tremendous love, compassion, and new zest for living. I'd invite you now to bring forth your prayers for all people that you are concerned for, for situations in this world that are complicated and confusing and heartbreaking, and for this planet in the quest for wholeness, peace, for light, love, and justice. And so it is we pray. We uphold all candidates and political parties, workers and volunteers on this BC Election Day weekend. We honor all who are working on behalf of this province. We uphold Treaty 1752 and the Mi'kmaq's right to a moderate livelihood, especially, O oh God, as we commit to a world free from racism and hate. We uphold all who suffer from burdens that feel heavy and hopeless and that are so hard to carry day to day to day. May our listening draw us ever nearer to each other. May our listening draw us nearer to ourselves. And may our listening lead us to marvel and celebrate this sacred web of life which connects us all. And so, O oh God, with gratitude, we offer these our prayers as we pledge to continue to work towards your vision of a new heaven on earth. So may it be. Amen. Divide us, no matter 
how high Ain't no storm can untie us For all it may try We are leaves on the same tree Under one sky Don't let nobody tell you otherwise Long to each other, we are sister and brother, born to love one another. It's whispered by the wind to all living things. It's in every Wild birds sing, shines in the newborn's eyes, faces lined and worn. It's the tide that finds us all, and it won't be joy. We belong to each other, we are sister and brother, born to love one another. stars turned flesh and bone we are travelers on a bus ride home. when we laugh and we cry and we rise and we fall yea fuss and fight but through it all we belong to each other we are Sister and brother, born to love one another. We belong to each other. We are sister and brother, born to love one another. on the same sea You and me We belong to each other So as Mark has mentioned, uh, we're into the final week of our scripture and story from 1 Samuel. And today we pick up where we left off last week. Eli has taught Samuel how to listen for God's voice. And today we uh, launch into hearing what the message that Samuel is called to deliver to Eli and the people of Israel. Reading from 1 Samuel 3 verses 10 to 21. The Lord came and stood there and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, speak, your servant is listening. Then God said to him, Someday I am going to do something to the people of Israel that is so terrible that everyone who hears about it will be stunned. On that day, I will carry out all my threats against Eli's family from beginning to end. I have already told him that I am going to punish his family forever because his sons have spoken evil things against me. Eli knew they were doing this, but he did not stop them. So I solemnly declare to the family of Eli that no sacrifice or offering will ever be able to remove the consequences of this terrible sin. 
Samuel stayed in bed until morning. Then he got up and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli about the vision. Eli called him, Samuel, my boy. Yes, sir, answered Samuel. What did the Lord tell you, Eli asked. Don't keep anything from me. God will punish you severely if you don't tell me everything that was said. So Samuel told him everything. He did not keep anything back. Eli said, God will do whatever seems best. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and made come true everything that Samuel said. So all the people of Israel, from one end of the country to the other, knew that Samuel was indeed a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to reveal himself at Shiloh, where he had appeared to Samuel and had spoken to him. And when Samuel spoke, all of Israel listened. So here we are in week four of this passage. And this is probably the most difficult part of this passage. And partly it's difficult because it feeds into a very old idea of God that many people still have. And that's the notion of a wrathful, vengeful, punishing God. The kind of God that is almost waiting to catch us doing something wrong so we can be snuffed out in some way or reminded how bad or poor or insignificant we are. It's part of the theology that feeds into the fall redemption piece of our Christian theology of Jesus dying for our sins so that this vengeful, wrathful God will somehow be appeased. In this case, in the story, somehow it will be Eli and his family who pay the price in order that the nation of Israel can go on and live in prosperity. So I want to challenge that notion and have you reframe the way you hear this story. Throughout all of the Hebrew scriptures, God's often presented as the one who draws a line, who says, cross this and you're going to be punished, or I'm angry with you and this is what's going to happen. And because scripture really is made up of a collection of stories that come out of the human condition and the human experience, I think it's often a projection onto God, that God must feel angry and God must be disappointed. In the same way when we've been hurt or violated in some way, sometimes our initial response is one of anger, lashing out. But time and time again in the stories, God's heart is softened or God's mind is changed, or God shifts, or God repents. And I think that was the early community's struggle, is trying to get a sense of, of who God was, and God became enigmatic in many ways. It's intriguing to me that many theologians have chosen to focus on this obedience and vengeful peace of God rather than the one who shifts, pivots, whose primary modus of operandi turns out to be grace. So that's a part of what has to be addressed as we think about this piece of the story. But there's another important piece. So last week, Samuel hears this call and thinks that it's Eli. And Eli has to listen deeply to what it is that Samuel is saying to him in the middle of the night to help teach Samuel how to hear the message of God. This week we hear that message. But it says in the passage of the next morning, Samuel sleeps in. Samuel doesn't want to share with Eli what he's heard. How difficult it must be for a young boy to have to deliver to his elder, his mentor, this particular message. So Samuel puts it off as long as he can. 
He gets up in the morning, carries on with his duties, avoiding Eli as much as he can. Finally, Eli confronts him and says, Tell me, Samuel, what did God say? I can imagine Samuel swallowing hard, trying to figure out whether he should soften it or soft pedal it or leave something out of the story so as to not hurt Eli's feelings. But Eli's really, really clear. Give it to me straight. I need to hear what God has said. And so in this case, then it becomes Samuel who helps Eli listen deeply to what's being said. I'm sure I'm not alone in the experience of having someone come to me and say, I need to talk to you about something. Or perhaps, I, I have something I need to tell you. And when that happens, if you're like me, your heart goes into your throat a little bit, your anxiety level goes up, your heartbeat increases. And your mind goes to all sorts of places of wondering what it is this person has to tell you. I know as I've aged and grown in wisdom that when those times come, I don't find myself being in a place of defensiveness, but rather trying simply to listen to what it is the person is offering as feedback. Eli, in his wisdom, at the age that he is, is past the place where he's going to react. And he simply listens deeply into what it is that Samuel has to say. And Samuel's words are not easy to hear. And it causes Eli to have to reflect on the kind of leader he was, the kind of parent that he was, and the kind of future that he set up for the people in his community. The story doesn't really tell us all of how Eli responds, but it does say that over time, the community saw that indeed, the consequences of the way that Eli and his family were came to fruition. And the community began to trust that Samuel was indeed a prophet of God. Now that's another interesting word, a prophet. I've told and talked about this before, but prophets in the biblical tradition are not crystal ball gazers. They're not those who tell the future from the perspective of having some sort of magic skill or a crystal ball. Instead, they are ones who listen deeply and observe what is happening and describe the social situation, the context, and point out that there are natural consequences for what we do down the road. The piece of music that we began with, Spirit Open My Heart, to the joy and pain of living, is a reminder to us that life is a mixture of those things. There are things that bring us joy, and there are things that are painful that happen to us. But there are also things of joy and pain that we are the authors of. And sometimes there are natural consequences to choices that we've made. And as parents, that's often a strategy we use with our children to show them that there are natural consequences. The same is true for us. In this story, Eli and his family are going to be living out the consequences of the rudeness, the disrespect, of the taking advantage of women and the poor by his sons. And Eli's refusal to set boundaries and to reprimand them. All of us know what it means to live consequences of choices that we've made. Whether it be health choices that we've made or relationship choices we've made and the consequences that can unfold from those. 
or a whole myriad of other decisions that we make. But that is also true of us as a society. We find ourselves now in a climate emergency as part of the living consequences of choices that we've made as a society. In BC, in the month of September, we had 127 overdose deaths. That health emergency is a predictable consequence of choices and policies that we've made. The widening gap between the rich and the poor is also bringing about natural consequences, the rise in homelessness and those who are dispossessed and those who find themselves desperate in this economic climate. These are the kinds of things that a prophet speaks to as part of that tradition. And all of us get to a point where we eventually are able to see that these consequences become a part of our own regrets. I once ran a course here a couple of years ago about a good death. And part of a good death was about being able to die with few regrets be able to get to the place where we've addressed the things in our life that we wish that we had done. Regrets, consequences, all those things are perhaps the places in which there's the greatest opportunity for growth in each of us. When we're able to hear what it is, rather than see ourselves as now being eternally punished by God, we might instead see that the road is open for us to behave or make a change or make a difference. In each of those social situations that I name for us as individuals and societies, while sometimes things are irreversible, there are always other choices for us to make. In moving forward. And so it is that the role of the prophet is to both name what the challenges are and to name what the hope is, where the possibilities lie, and a reminder that God is faithful and makes this journey with us. The piece of music that we conclude with, Teach Your Children Well, is a song in a sense that helps us see that balance in life. The first chorus talks about teaching your children well, all the wisdom and all the things that you've learned from trial and error and pain and hardship. But then it flips itself. And the second chorus says, children, teach your parents well for the hells that they have lived through need your hope, your energy, and your forgiveness for them to move forward. Eli needs Samuel's presence. He needs both the bad news and the good news. May all of us hear both the possibilities and the consequences as we move forward into the world together. Thanks be to God. Amen.
their father's hell did slowly go by and feed them on your dreams. The one they pick, the one you'll know by. Don't oh, ever ask them why. If they told you, you would cry. So just look at them and sigh And know they love you And you of tender years Can know the fear If they told you, you would cry. So just look at them and sigh. And know they love you. If they told you, you would cry, so just look at them and sigh, and know they love you. Go out into the world, into the joy and pain of living. And regardless of where your journey takes you, the doors of hope and or regret that you open, may you be reminded that you do not do so alone and that God loves you from the beginning until the end, through the trials and the errors, that there is nothing, says the Apostle Paul, nothing in all of creation that can separate us from God's love. May that be a reality for you in your soul this day. Amen.